So hello, welcome to the August UN Info Session. My name is Amanda Lowry and I am a volunteer with the San Diego Chapter of the United Nations Association. The San Diego Chapter was established in 1946 and promotes engagement with the United Nations by translating global initiatives into a local context through education, advocacy, and other programs. You can learn more about these programs and what we do on our website, unasd.org, and you can also find our previous UN Info Sessions on our website and on our YouTube channel. So I'd like to welcome our guest, Michelle Price, the president of the San Diego chapter of Califia Now to discuss the importance of all women, especially women of color's political participation and socioeconomic equality. So in celebration of the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote in the United States, which is ratified on August 18th, this month's UN Info Session will highlight the progress of women's political rights, particularly women of color. Women's political participation is at the core of the Sustainable Development Goals, especially SDG 5, Gender Equality, and SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities. So Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself, share a little bit about your organization and how uh, Califia now impacts San Diego? I would love to, thank you, Amanda. Thanks for having me. Um, Califia now is the uh, San Diego chapter and we have a chapter, a sister chapter in Los Angeles. And the origin or genesis of Califia Now was through some of my sisters who decided that they were going to, uh, they had been recruited into the Now organization. And really all of us were like, really? Are they still around? Like, what are they doing, right? You know, wasn't that just a bunch of people who burn bras and stuff? Like literally, we were like that, right? <laughs> At least I was like that. And so, it took me a minute to just say, okay, I don't really understand this. Then with Califia, once I understood the story of Califia, do you know who she is? Yeah, I did some uh, research and I understand that it's, um, her story is the origins of how California was named. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so if you would like and to And she was more actually a indigenous African, uh, it was a book that was written. It was one of the first I guess books that was written for entertainment. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like one of those in the 1500s. And in the book, they had a fictitious island called California. And Queen Califia was the Amazonian black warrioress mm -hmm. who had 200 griffins at her disposal. It's amazing. <laughs> and a tribe. And she fell in love with a Muslim and went to fight on his behalf. And literally, that's who California, they say California was named after. And so, we decided that we wanted to create a brand within the NOW organization for women of color, for black women and women of color. And the things that we focus on are economic empowerment and political empowerment. Those are the things that we focus uh, women of color on. And we come at it from a perspective that's more culturally uh, in sync with who, who we are and we just had a huge campaign. I don't know if y'all saw that. We had a national campaign to replace the leadership of now mm -hmm. because she was not friendly to women of color. Mm -hmm. So that was, I would say that's kind of where we are now with this organization, but the organization in California is 20,000 strong. And uh, we have an all women of color board and we are really making changes. We, we think globally and nationally, but we act locally. Mm. Beautiful. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, definitely needed, you know, I love seeing any type of women empowerment organization, especially when it's on a local level, because that's where real change starts to come from. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a Goldman Sachs report that says if you wanna make change in a community, you give the money to the women, and if you really wanna make change, you give it to a black woman. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. We'll squeeze a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know how to do that. <laughs> awesome, great. Um, great, so um, on that too, um, a question that I have is that, so with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, what do you think where we are as the United States uh, stand on reaching gender equality since the passage? So within a hundred years, what, what is your thoughts on that? I know it's a large question, but anything that you have that might come up for you. Where are we with gender equality? 
sometimes I feel like we've made great strides. We have women governors. We have, uh, for the first time, a, a woman vice president elect. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm just gonna call her elect. A vice president running on a major ticket. Uh, we have made so many strides. We've got women in science. We've got women in tech. We've got women um, educators and, and not as many CEOs. There's not as many women in business in leadership that need to be. Mm -hmm. That's what I will say. Because if you had more women at the top, like CEO level, board level, you would have quite different policies right now with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. You would not be trying to send kids to school mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, the, the illnesses that are going around more for the adults than anything. You would have child care. You'd probably have national child care. Mm. It would probably be a right. Internet would be a right. All these things would be rights if women were um, more equal. Yeah. And, but I, I'm not going to say we haven't come far and we just have a way to go. Mm, yeah, and follow up on that too, uh, since you mentioned uh, Fortune 500 and CEOs, things like that. So there's a statistic from 2018 um, showing that 50% of uh, the U.S. population are women um, and 47% uh, are part of the U.S. labor force with 52% of them of the labor force that's college educated. So with that, um, you know, we only see not even 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs being women, um, and only 22% of them are on the boards of these Fortune 500 companies. Um, but we did see in um, the 2018 elections for Congress um, and other state leadership that um, it was a horse historical number for women to be members of Congress. So we have 24% um, of members of Congress are women, but only women of color are representing less than 9% of members of Congress. So with that in mind and, and what we just spoke about, um, what do you think that, you know, despite re understanding that gender equality is important and that actually closing the gender gaps will positively affect the economy, um, why do you think that these disparities have continued to exist? Money. Money. Yeah. <laughs> capital. <laughs> it's capital. It's I will tell you that uh, I, this is a topic that I believe has to be addressed at some point. Um, I'm doing a local initiative here in San Diego called Sister Cities Project. Mm -hmm. And affluent business owners from the North County are going to be paired up with um, disadvantaged business owners in the South County, Black business owners. And we're going to do some masterminds and some, some you know, mentoring. Mm -hmm. And our real, our real issue is it's not really lack of capital. It's lack of capital, working capital. It's lack of access to credit even. Mm -hmm. um, and for women, Black women in particular, women of color, we have traditionally played a much more expanded role in our culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we went out and we got an education and we, you know, so that we could bring home the bacon and fry it up in the pan and all that, right? Mm -hmm. And, but, but what has happened because of the disproportionate share uh, war on drugs, we have become the chief cook, bottle washer, chauffeur, um, you know, uh, uh, foster moms, you know, because of the war on drugs, now we're foster moms, we're bail bondsmen, we're the matriarch, we're the family financier. We are split in, 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 in two. And so we left corporate America in search of entrepreneurial jobs because in search of becoming like, you know, taking what we know and trying to monetize that in the, the world because we need more flexibility, but it ends up that you don't have a source of income, you know, a consistent source of income. And then I think that most of the women that I know of color do not make the connections that they need to make. They don't know how to make the connections they need to make to the, the party, like it's, the thing is you gotta understand with women who have such multi, such full lives, yeah. if it's hard, we're not, we, we, we really can't, we don't have the time to do it or we don't, yeah. in order for us to do it, there have to be sacrifice, like major sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Like you're not home at night, 
right? But you're you're the grandma because dad's in jail. What you gonna do? Yeah. And it sounds, and it, yeah, lots of barriers that don't necessarily need to be there um, that mm -hmm. are, that the are. The other thing that could work is this idea um, that was floated by one of the candidates this year. And I, I don't remember, maybe Elizabeth Warren. It was funding campaigns nationally or something like that, like changing how campaign funding works. Now that could help. Yeah. <laughs> that could help. help. Yeah, if we had, you know, if we had an organization that really, um, like Run Women Want Run with Barbara Bree when she had started that, if we had something like that, that was actually boots on the ground for women of mm -hmm. color, that could help too, because we want the path, right? If the path is there and you've got all the tools and templates and people and, mm -hmm. and, and people to help you, then it doesn't become like just you one hand clapping out there trying to make things happen for yourself. Mm. Definitely sounds like uh, needing to build a team and a community to help everyone move forward, definitely. And then awesome. policy, I think understanding how policy actually works because maybe you can't run for office, but you could uh, champion some policy or you could help write a bill or you could do these things. I think that we, the, the most I remember learning about civics was in high school. There used to be this cartoon that came on on Saturdays called, called, uh, it was, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. Oh, yeah. It would come in between the cartoons mm -hmm. and it educated us on government and how stuff happened. I mean, there's, it was an effective way because I still remember it mm -hmm. and everybody that I talked to remembers it. <laughs> and so I think we as a society have to do a much better job of engaging youth in civic engagement. Mm -hmm. Let me follow up on that. I do have a question um, about, let's see, here we go. So um, speaking on that, do you see the public becoming more educated on the reality of inequalities, um, especially due to the current social justice movements going on and the presidential election. Um, and another follow up to that um, is I'd love to talk about your hashtag Mama Said Stop campaign, um, mm. which supports mothers of color who had lost their children um, in relations with police officers. And also, you know, any suggestions that you have on what the public can do to be more involved and, and support that movement. Ask me the first question again. What yeah. was the first question Definitely. about social justice? Have yeah. we, have we, do you think that we've made, move the dial, move the needle some? Essentially, yeah. I really do think we have. I think yeah. we have. And for the first time, I can say that with confidence mm -hmm. because of your generation, my grandkids' generation are not standing for it. You guys aren't going to have that. You're not going to have more of you than there are on the other side. Mm -hmm. So the whole Parkland, sh you know, shooting, all of these different things, you guys are coming of age, the Gen Z's, the millennials are key to this, I believe. They're key to what happened with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, because I think that what happened is for the first time, we were kind of captive audiences. We weren't, you know, it was right in the middle of the, the pandemic, right? The quarantine, we were all sheltering in place. and all we had to do, all people could do was watch. Mm -hmm. And that really and shows I believe actually. fundamentally people want to, to be involved and they want to make change. And the thing that scares me the most about all of this, whether people are understanding the social justice stuff, and maybe it's what makes the news, but think about what happened in Portland. Yeah. You got federal officers, mm -hmm. unmarked cars, taking citizens of the United States and putting them in unmarked vans and leaving them for hours. In what, it's like you cannot even believe that's this country. Right. And yet you have people out there that are supporting that. Well, they shouldn't be out there marching. Well, they shouldn't be doing this stuff. And so I think you can get discouraged, but I think we have to stay on the side of um, 
I think what we have to do is we have to rebuild that that moral character and re re in, reintroduce values into our family systems and it's going to be not easy and it's going to take all of us and and since black people are really more it's like we're like a village we have to try to bring everybody into that village and and take care of and take care of of each all of us we all really need to be looking out for each other i think that's but i do feel hopeful i'm very hopeful yeah and um, with that too, uh, could you speak a little bit more about um, the Mama Said Stop campaign? Mama Said Stop. Yeah. So Miss Carrie, Miss Carrie Brodus. Hey, Miss Carrie, I'm gonna give her a shout out. Hey. <laughs> she is so, she's like a sage. And <clears throat> she's like our, I don't know, what is she? She's like our conscience. <laughs> she's our conscience. So she's about a generation um, ahead of me. Yeah. And she kind of just came up with this that said, Mama said, stop. And we all understood that because everybody knows that phrase, right? If you got brothers and sisters, you know, Mama said, stop. Mm -hmm. And it fit, it fit the George Floyd narrative really perfectly because really it's about, you know what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. You know how you're supposed to treat each other. You know that mamas don't play. Well, here's the deal. Everybody's scared of mama. Everybody. It, you don't mess with mama. I was married to a six foot seven, 250 pound man. For some reason, his mother, one day I, I, we lived in a, a complex where you had to buzz to get in. So we're in there, we're laughing, joking, me and him and my two daughters. And all of a sudden we hear this, this is like, a, what, you expect somebody? No, not me. We look outside and there's his mother. She's 5'11". And she's got the minister with her and his sister, who's also 5'11". And she's got a big two by four in her hand. Mm -hmm. And she thought that somehow I had called and hung up and that I was in trouble and that her son was acting up. And so she came with her, <laughs> she was getting ready. She was like, oh, wait a minute. You know what I'm saying? Like she literally was about ready to like, hit him over the head with this thing. And let me tell you something, that six foot seven man never messed with his mother, never messed with his mother. So that's really what the mama campaign is about for us because we understand those words. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands, mama said stop. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is we need to stop. We have to stop this, stop all of this All of this anger, all of this arguing, all of this destruction, all of this um, just being being mean, just stop, stop it. <laughs> um, and I do have a question too about um, engagement. And I was curious about your thoughts, where, where do you think that we can engage men specifically or um, individuals who identify as male uh, to support um, and actually create different uh, how they can essentially support women's rights and, you know, what physical measures and actual items that they can do to help. They can support the women's rights by the ERA. <laughs> yeah. Get involved with the ERA. Yeah. That would be one way. That would be the preferred way for me mm -hmm. because it's a structure. Males need structure. They're very systemic, systematic, um, very, you know, step by step. I think that's how we have to, and women are more, I understand that women have more white matter and men have more gray matter in their brains. And that has something to do with all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I've already shared that I am, uh, I'm a neurodiverse person. So I have ADHD. Um, they call us twice exceptional these days, you know, gifted as a child and then find out you got ADD at like 48. Like, so that's what happened. <laughs> so that was the problem. That's why I yelled at that lady, that teacher, you know. Um, but I think men need structure and if women want to, if we want them to help, maybe what we, what I think that they would be awesome at is helping a structure an approach. Mm -hmm. Like we have to use, use their strengths mm -hmm. and men are, they have, they have strengths that women don't have and women have strengths that men don't have. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd like to say it now, Khalifa, you know, we're not, we're, we're a new feminist, <laughs> you know, we love men. So there are a million black men missing 
from their families and they're imprisoned in America's prison industrial complex. That mm -hmm. means that up to six to 10, six out of 10 black women are single. Yeah. You know, we don't have the financial help from the man uh, that we used to have. I was raised by, in a, in a, in a nuclear family, I was raised with a mom and a dad and, and they stayed married for 54 years. So my mom passed. Now everything wasn't hunky dory. It wasn't all good. Yeah. My father was a military asshole, you know, <laughs> but my mother was educated. She was, you know, she graduated from Dillard in the forties. Wow. You got to think about that, right? Like, so there's a legacy in my family of history and being involved in politics. Uh, a. Philip Randolph, who led the first walk, walk, the very first march on Washington in the 1930s, used to sit around. My my uh, grandfather helped to start the Brotherhood of Pullman Porters, wow. which was the union that A. Philip Randolph organized for black men who were working on the trains. Mm -hmm. So it's in my blood, and men can help with the movement. We just have to ask and invite. Mm. Great. Um, thank you for sharing. And I, uh, a lot of, especially with the 100th anniversary, there's a lot of conversations about women in leadership. And uh, one of them that I thought would be um, great to share, and maybe your opinion on as well, is that since there are a lack of women in leadership positions, men who are in those leadership positions should be more open to granting opportunities for these women to take the lead on on different projects, assignments, things like that. Um, so do you have any thoughts on that or if, if you've seen that in the past? I do, I do. Um, well, you know, we, we have a phrase with my sister city's project. His name is Sean, Sean uh, McLondon. And we kind of were having a conversation and we came up with this phrase like, put your white privilege to work. <laughs> yeah. Put your white privilege to work. You want to help? You got privilege. You, there's a lot of ways you can help. And that, I think that plays into what we talked about earlier about uh, finance, like campaign finance and business getting capital. What does that feel like? It feels like usually, what, what are they? They are older white men sitting in front, of, sitting in judgment of you as you're trying to talk to them about your ideas. Mm -hmm. And what does it feel like? You feel like, daddy, can I have some money? <laughs> right? Right, yeah. Can I have a credit card, daddy? I need to go buy a dress. <laughs> right? right. Isn't it? That's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. So we would rather max out a credit card. We would rather scrape by yeah. than do that. Mm -hmm. And if what men need to do is understand that, go below the surface, you know, put yourself. I had a mentor. I've had some great male mentors. And he told me one time we were talking, he said, you know what? Switch, change, switch chairs with the other person and argue from their point of view. Mm. I think if more men did that, and women too, we might have a whole different conversation. And so with that too, with the struggles that women face and to get into these especially political and man managerial leadership positions, um, speaking of San Diego, what in your opinion um, do you see that there's a success of women in political and corporate leadership or, you know, what are your thoughts with San Diego specifically? We need a female mayor again. We've had a, 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 a you know, succession of, of men. And what we have to understand as citizens is that it's not just our neighborhood. It's not just this neighborhood. It's the whole totality of all the neighborhoods. And we really do need to be more equitable in how we just deliver resources to neighborhoods. If anybody's gonna solve it, I think a woman could, could bring it together and, and, and make a solution that everybody can, can live with. I think we're a lot more alike than we are different. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah. I, and I, 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 if we could just convince people of that. You know, I think we might all be able to, to, to get some, some things going. I think San Diego is at a inflection point that's going to determine how well we actually come out of this whole pandemic, how well we um, recover. Mm -hmm. Because it's shown all the disparities 
shown up everything. It's shown up all the, it, it, it really has shed a light on the differences in how people are, are taken care of and treated. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I also wanted to ask you about, um, Califia now hosted the uh, Vote and Action Center back in February, March of earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would like to ask you if, if you could share any insight about the importance of that event that you held and also any impact that you saw with the public coming together for, for that event. We saw an increase in registrations. Mm -hmm. We did. Uh, my, my entire, my thought about all of that is you can register, but we got to get you out to vote. <laughs> that is the, that is the key. Um, that was a, a good campaign. Voter suppression is a real thing. And anybody who's watching this, who does not live in California or, does, or lives somewhere like a, what, where, where did they stand in line for hours mm -hmm. to vote? I think it where was, was that? It was a place where they stood, they said Ariana Grande sent trucks, sent food trucks, and celebrities sent things so that people would not leave lines you know, so that they wouldn't get discouraged and leave. How are we going to handle that? That is the thing. Like we can, yeah, we can get people registered to vote. And we did. And, and basically anytime you focus a lens on anything, if you focus, what happens when you focus a magnifying glass on, on a, on a, on a leaf yeah. or a bird? <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're young, you do those kinds of things, right? And like when you focus that that sun and burn a hole through that leaf, I think that we can do we can easily do that. It's just getting people to the action to to do the the next thing, explaining to people that it's not just the person. Like I don't want to vote for there's two old white men. Well, you know what? Which one is going to do less harm? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, that's the reality that we're facing right now. And hopefully in the future, especially the next presidential election, we won't have to make a choice that way. It can be a choice what of what we really saying. want. Mm -hmm. Well, what it, what it, you know what it does, Amanda, is it makes us grow up. It makes us be adults. And we have to choose. We can't get what we want always. But we got to try to get the best thing we can get. Well, that's essentially the most of the questions that I have for you. With that, thank you, Michelle, very much for spending time with me today. Um, I really appreciate our conversation, and I do think that it's very honest and real and can be applicable to um, all viewers, especially those in the San Diego community, and also giving insight on how we can help your organization. And, um, you know, we'll have our information, your information in our um, our video description as well so people can find you and help support you. That would be uh, awesome. Yeah, so I'll get, I have a brief presentation to discuss the sustainable development goals and why they're important to us. So the sustainable development goals were created in 2015 by the all UN member states for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Initiative. So there are, thir or excuse me, there are 17 sustainable development goals that address the global call to action to promote various and important initiatives such as gender equality, ending poverty, and environmentalism, and, and things to ensure positive life across the world. So specifically, SDG 5 addresses the gender inequalities across our world with a call to action to support and advocate for changes to grant women and girls equal access to political, socioeconomic, health representation, and legal rights. So as we discussed today, Supporting the effort to reach gender equality on a local level can help bring us to a, the broader goal of gender equality across the globe. Then we also have reduce inequality, sustainable development goal number 10, um, to reduce inequality within and among countries. So again, this talking our having our conversation today talks about how we can actually reach to solve that issue on a local level and how we can bring that to the global sphere as well. And then so with that, I wanted to thank you again for participating and bringing a such an important discussion and like to say that 
for viewers and in the future to join our monthly info sessions. Um, where we host local businesses, nonprofits, grassroots organizations, and leaders in the San Diego County that work to reach the sustainable development goals in our community specifically. So please follow us on social media and use these hashtags on the screen to help our mission and educate our community and ultimately reach the 17 sustainable development goals here and abroad. So with that, thank you very much. And Those so, were amazing. Yeah. So colorful. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. Then with the kind of the iconic system there so that you can just look at it, you know, and if you look at it, you, you know what you know what you're looking at. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, again, with social media, it's really important to have, you know, ways that multiple people from across the world can connect through the same unit. And so with hashtags, that can be absolutely movements. So we got to use all the tools and resources that we have. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. This is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. This, this awesome. gave me, this opened my eyes up. I love this. I love yeah. that. I love global things. Right. Yeah. yeah. Things that are big. Bigger the better. And especially so, with. But things can feel so big yeah. that you feel like, what can I do? Right, right. You know, and, and, that, and what I'm here, what I'm seeing here is this is what you can do. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. You can either be doing it or you can help amplify those who are doing it. 